Do you have a plan to deal with Mitch McConnell? I do. <laughs> yes, Warren, Biden, Sanders, Buttigieg, even Booker, names you likely know. And that little girl was me. Harris, Castro, Swalwell, some names more people may know now. We break down the winners and the losers from the Democratic debate. And I got the opposite policies of Mr. T on a whole lot of issues. We sit down one on one with Bill Weld, the Republican who wants to make sure President Trump never gets to the general election. Talk politics starts right now. Welcome to Talk Politics. I'm Brian Shackman. Maybe like you, still recovering from watching 20 Democrats trying to get me to listen to them. So now we get uh, the first debate in the books, a few days old. Maybe you need a little bit of a refresher before we get down and dirty here and talk politics. Here's four hours of talk reduced to around 60 seconds. I'm with Bernie on Medicare for All. I'm still talking about everybody but, else. But you're looking at just one small part of this. I'm talking about a comprehensive rewrite of our immigration That's laws. That's not true. And if we, we have to bring our troops home from Afghanistan. ICE are ripping away parents from their American children, spouses and the like, and are creating fear in cities all across this country. Necesitamos incluir cada persona en nuestra democracia. Ha demonizado los inmigrantes. Es inaceptable. Voy a cambiar reste. We'll say adios to Donald Trump. <laughs> Joe Biden was right when he said it was time to pass the torch to a new generation of Americans 32 years ago. He's still right today. Hey guys, you know what? America does not want to witness a food fight. They want to know how we're going to put food on their table. Yeah. The police force in South Bend is now 6% black in a city that is 26% black. Why has that not improved over your two terms as mayor? because I couldn't get it done. In the last 30 years, the top 1% has seen a $21 trillion increase in their wealth. There was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools, and she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. We'll hear from more from Mr. Biden later. Okay, so it's not going to be all one-sided. Alison King was there, and of course Sue O'Connell joining us as well. Let's just get right to it, uh, Alison. I'll start with you. Just give me your winners and losers. You had a couple of days to think about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you can't say that Kamala Harris was not a winner in all this. Was she the the biggest winner? I think, I think so. she was. I think she absolutely was. I yeah. mean, she went. And she did exactly what she needed to do. She's already uh, a candidate that really excites the Democratic base. She's a black woman with a great back, uh, you know, great resume. Um, she needed to get out there and look tough, but likable. But uh, yeah, I mean, she was actually able to convey being warm, yeah. you know, and 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 caring, and a, and that story about her as a, that resonated with so many people. So well, the interesting thing is, and again, their gender dynamics come into play, mm -hmm. and so she got emotional, but she didn't take it maybe too far. You know, she went to the point where you could tell it because moved she's a her, prosecutor. right? But you, <laughs> but but she still was tough, and, yep. and I think that that was really important. So I mean, I think I would agree with you that she was the clear winner. I'll get to my other winner, but is there anyone else you thought? that made hay in these two nights. I mean, on a lower level, a Hul a Julian Castro went into this an unknown, basically. Clearly in the bottom yep. ten. And he went, bam, he just went right after t uh, Beto O'Rourke, and which is what he needed to do. Why he, is that, though? Is he Because you know, they're both from that part of the country, and yes. he needed to bury him to get some I attention? I mean, I think he needs, you know, Beto cut, they cut into each other's fundraising capabilities and just that, that you know, the Texas base that they need. But, but also, he just needed to show that he could be a fighter and someone, he, we talked about him when he came off, you know, off the right. stage, and that's all, he, he had a much lower bar. And, and Elizabeth Warren won the first night, and she had all of it's the like a other. JV team, kind of, a little True, bit. True, but though. she did, she was, she was the, she was the thing that everybody was comparing to. Right. So the people on the left of her were comparing how they matched up against Elizabeth Warren's policies, and the people to the right of her, like Booker and Klobuchar, were comparing themselves to her. So she was actually what everybody on night one was being measured by, and I think we have a little anti-Warren bias because we're here in Massachusetts, right. but I imagine across the country people were really yeah. enthused. I, you know, I want to get the losers. I think Trump was a winner here because I'm not sure, it's going to be difficult, I'll talk about this later in the show, difficult to beat him in some ways, in some respects, and I think that I'm not sure anybody came across as convincing that they can they necessarily get him in a debate and really take it to him. Well, I it wanna... doesn't matter. We've seen, you know, I mean, Hillary Clinton beat him in every debate. 
So it did, that's not what mattered. I think right now it's really about which one, which of these five, five will come to the top and will right. the other and by the way, Kamala away. Harris walked out of that with people saying she could take on Trump. Yeah. Right, and I think so. And wouldn't that be a great debate to watch? Or even like a, maybe a Buttigieg against Pence in a debate would be another fascinating thing to watch. <laughs> I, I, losers, I'm going to come with mine. I think Beto definitely was the biggest loser because he had the most to lose out of the people that did lose, and I think he lost almost all of it. I think that's, for me, clear. Sanders, I thought, was a loser in the sense that I felt like his conversations were the same that he's had for five or six or he 10 or 12 or 15 years. Like To me, there's nothing different about what he's saying, and I think it, he is older and it feels old. He had a lost opportunity. He could have definitely taken it to Joe Biden. He's done it before, and I don't know why he didn't do it on the debate stage, because he does it effectively, too. But he stayed in his lane. He was passionate. He was classic Bernie. But as you point out, he didn't do that extra. And I think Joe Biden was a bit of a loser, too, because, you know, we, people talk about how there should be no gaffes, right? That's what we need from no, Joe Biden, no gaffes. But he also, you know, had that response to Kamala, Kamala Harris where he just didn't finish it. He, he kind of stopped, stopped on stopped time. Who on? does that in a debate? Right. I, mean, okay. I follow the rules when right. I get my time cues, but I mean, but that yeah, was... I'm so glad you finished. mentioned that. I thought that was very weird. And yeah. at the end of the day, I was saying, okay, what was his big moment on stage? At least he... No, I couldn't think of anything. Yeah, didn't have one. Yeah. Didn't have one. And, and he, sometimes he looks like, you know, he's the guy at your party who everyone's talking about, but he's very happy. He's like he's missing the fact that, you know, you're not you're not on his side. And it, that kind of came across a little bit. I think the polls are going to be very interesting. Yep. Does, does Harris get into double digits consistently, and, and how much does, does Biden lose? Okay, a couple quick things, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, there were several moments. There weren't a ton, but there were several moments. Is there one to you guys, I'll start with you, Sue, that you think will actually last past this news cycle? Yeah, I definitely think the Kamala Harris exchange with uh, with with Biden regarding the busing issue obviously here in the Boston area you know we, we have firsthand right. uh, uh, feelings and experience with busing but Joe Biden put himself in a box because he said things and he said things on the record and he's trying to recast what he he thought based on a state's rights issue and based on federal government overreaching but he's putting himself a little bit deeper in the box because you know if the federal government can't step in to get a quality education for kids who's supposed to do it so I think that, that this has resonance uh, I would say the lasting moment was the question Raise your hand if you think that private insurance should be abolished. And all those hands went up. And I think that lays out a path for the Democrats that is going to be very tricky to navigate. And I, you know, they... Harris has already tried to walk it back. Yeah, she said she... And I think she... I mean, she's more conservative than people yes, uh, really understand. I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're digging into her history as a prosecutor in California, uh, I think that those who, who ca characterize her as being very liberal will be surprised, but she she walked that back, and I think yeah. she just made a mistake. I think the key is, and we got to stop it there, but get the nomination and then walk it back to the middle. Uh, thank you very much, guys. And one thing is clear from these debates is that there are a lot of candidates. In fact, <laughs> there were people on the stage that most Americans have never heard of, or maybe you have. We went to the streets of Boston to find out how many people could name maybe five of them. No, I cannot. I think I can. Uh, Kamala Harris, Amy Klobuchar, um, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Joe Biden. Uh, Biden. That's the only one I got. Oh, gosh. All right. So Elizabeth Warren, uh, Joe Biden, um, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, and Keith Buttigieg. If I connect. Can you name five of the Democrats running? Uh, Warren, Buttigieg. Um, Sanders, uh, Beto, uh, um, uh, Biden, uh, Harris, Booker. Um, those are kind of my top eight. So eight. <laughs> it's our record for the day, right there. Okay. All right, our pronunciation of Beto, Buttigieg, and Kamala struggling a little bit here in New England. Up next, actually, we go to New Hampshire. No, New Hampshire comes to us. Two Granite State journalists who have sat down with pretty much every candidate, Paul Steinhauser and Chris Ryan, give us the inside scoop from the campaign trail next on Talk Politics. Donald Trump has put us in a horrible situation. We do have enormous income inequality. And the one thing I agree on is we can make massive cuts in the $1.6 trillion in tax loopholes out there, and I would be going about eliminating Donald Trump's tax cuts for the wealthy. 
That's Joe Biden from Thursday night. He actually was in Iowa this weekend. He'll be back in New Hampshire later this week because, as we well know, the places to campaign right now, well, we'll throw in South Carolina and Nevada, but it's basically Iowa and New Hampshire. And both Paul Steinhauser and Chris Ryan have been in the thick of Granite State politics for a few election cycles now. And every week they host on background on nhtalkradio.com, and they are on the trail all week long. They made the trek south for us to give us basically, I, I think the two of you, I don't think we can get insight any better for what's going on in New Hampshire. So thanks for making the ride. I hope traffic wasn't too bad <laughs> getting down to Massachusetts. Uh, I'll, st I'll start with you, Chris. I, I mean, basically, people want to know what the energy like is in New Hampshire. And with 24 candidates, uh, is it hard for half of these people to get anyone to show up? Everybody draws decent crowds from number one down to, uh, to number 23. Uh, there has been you know, challenges, obviously, for the lesser-known candidates, and a lot of their events will start off with the things that are kind of pre-set up. They'll go to speak to a, a college group right. or a special interest group. Well, uh, only the big-name candidates can have standalone events until they draw uh, a significant amount of, of interest. But I noticed early on there's a tremendous amount of energy, particularly on the progressive side, uh, for Democrats. Uh, early on, uh, Pete Buttigieg was not known, and you'd go to an event, whether it was one in a small town like Raymond or in other places, and you'd see a significant amount of individuals uh, there, up to 80 to 100 people. Um, so the, the, there has been enough interest amongst progressives to spread that out amongst uh, all the candidates. How's it compared to 2016 with the Republicans, energy-wise? There's more energy this time around. There is. Uh, there was a hunger to, <clears throat> to get Barack Obama out of the White House, replace him with a Republican. But Democrats here in New Hampshire are so hungry. They want to vote today. You know, they had some really good results in the midterms in New Hampshire in 2018. That energy just carried forward. I remember early January, school night, work night, Julian Castro was in town. The place was mobbed, pop, mobbed in the Tri-City area. And it wasn't just for Julian Castro. It was just because these activists and these Democrats wanted to get out there, get this campaign going. Right. You know, it's funny. Castro had a very good night in the debates in terms of sort of casting Beto aside, who was sort of his in-state rival. Uh, he now, we're no, we know him a little more, right? So give me a person who maybe didn't even make a good impression in the debates, who's got a good ground game or has a major presence and is underrated in New Hampshire. I think two individuals really stand out in terms of their ground games and the type of, of feeling they've created amongst voters. And those are Cory Booker as well as Kirsten Gillibrand. They've spent a lot of time in the Granite State so far. They have not reaped the rewards in regards to their poll numbers at this point, but they have good staffing, particularly Cory Booker, and I, they are positioned to rise at some point. But candidates continue to wait for that moment. and. Uh, for the most part, moments come out of debates. Yeah, and Gillibrand did not have a Correct. moment. She had a strong and, performance, and, and but not a moment. Booker did a little bit better. How about from your perspective? Yes, when we look at the organizations in New Hampshire, and that's important because New Hampshire is, remember, it's a retail politics state. Right, it's you get one voter at a time. Yeah, yeah. And so to have a strong organization on the ground is crucial in a state like New Hampshire. That's more important than the TV commercials. Uh, besides Booker, who has a great organization, and Gillibrand, also, you know, Count Elizabeth Warren, your senator. She's got a huge organization in the state. Joe Biden went from zero to 60 pretty quickly. He got it in late April, but now he's probably got more staff on the ground than anybody else in the state. And Bernie Sanders, listen, New Hampshire was Bernie Sanders country back in 2016. He's got a pretty significant staff on the ground. And one more, John Delaney, right? Really? Really. He's actually put some good money, and he's got a lot of money. He's probably the wealthiest of the 23 candidates. He's sunk a lot of money into staffing both in Iowa and New Hampshire. Do you think he can stick around through the fall? Do you think he's a guy who will make it to the primary? He, if he wants to keep self-financing, he can stick around right. as long as he wants. Well, the question I want to ask is who's overrated? I want to know who are these marquee names, maybe the top six, who you think, eh, they might look good on national network, but it's not, not happening. Uh, uh, for overplayed, you know, listen, Joe Biden, he's got, he, right now he's still the clear front runner. He didn't have the best debate. I think that's right. pretty fair to say. Yep. But his crowds have not been that energetic. They're not that huge in size either. So, you know, he's getting the support right now because of his name recognition. But on the ground, he hasn't wowed anybody yet. But the Joe Biden voter is a pragmatic one. It's a person who's never going to attend a rally. It's somebody who just wants good government right. and a White House that uh, does not have the chaos that currently exists, a semblance of normal. They don't want to attend to political events. They're not going to, to go to any political events. They right. just want good government. Real quick, give me the last five standing. I won't hold you to it. Last five standing, well, let's, let's uh, Biden, Buttigieg, Warren, Booker, Harris. I, I, any, I, uh, uh, you deviating from any of those? I th um, I I'm not sure about, uh, about Booker. Um, I think Biden, Sanders, uh, Warren, 
Buttigieg and Harris um, would be my my four. Uh, at Booker, I still need to see at more from. There hasn't been any upwards mobility in terms of his polling. The ground organization is there, and he's set to reap the rewards. But how's he going to do it? Yeah. Chris Paul, we appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll have you back as we get closer to the primary. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate All right, thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks, All right, in the interest of equal time, right, and perhaps dealing with a, maybe a little bit of Democrat fatigue, we sit down with William Wells, former U.S. Attorney, Mass Governor, Libertarian VP candidate, and now the candidate challenging President Trump in the Republican primary. And he's actually got a new meme-worthy nickname for the president. He'll share it with you next. All right, so we've talked enough about the Democrats. Let's focus on the Republicans and the one challenger right now to President Trump. Former Governor William Well joins us in studio. Uh, Governor, thank you so much thank for you, being Brian. here. Thank you, Brian. Always a pleasure. Uh, listen, so you've been at it a few months now. Is, is anything changed for you, or is it strategy, everything's consistent all the way through? Well, people were kind of surprised when I started out, and I've been spending a lot of time uh, in and amongst the crowds, New Hampshire and elsewhere, and I would say I do detect uh, a greater feeling that people are just exhausted by this president and they're exhausted by the uh, acrimony in, in the country, just the, the bitterness between the two parties and everybody's teeth are kind of on edge and uh, you know there's this low-grade anxiety which I do associate with Mr. T in Washington. You know it's his strategy, him and Steve Bannon, to stir that up and the more people are upset, uh, resentful, even angry, the better they think that is for them. But, you know, my take is we're better than this, and most people know that at some level. Well, I want to get into that a little bit more in a sec, but I just want to focus uh, specifically, is it sort of, it's New, New Hampshire a bust for you still? I mean, that's your, I wouldn't say 100% focus, but it's in the high 90s, correct? Well, you know, I have the advantage. I can uh, campaign in New Hampshire almost every day and sleep in my own bed, so right. that, that is an advantage. But, uh, no, I would say my first thought is, all of New England led by New Hampshire and then the mid-Atlantic states and then you know I'd be crazy not to spend a bit of time uh, out west sooner rather than later uh, California is not Trump friendly right. Utah is not Trump friendly Oregon and Washington are very sort of uh, my, my brand of politics so RNC is obviously not on board uh, no. there's a lot of forces against you uh, well there's really one force and that's the administration giving orders to the RNC which they never used to do and to the state parties, you know, don't let Bill Weld anywhere near Right, but the they're, not, they're not pushing back. So, I mean, how are you financially? Are you able to get people to say, you know what, I'm going to invest in this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time in New York and Boston. Uh, my, my roots are rather deep. So we've seen Elizabeth Warren. She had a, a very slow start to her campaign, but she's been consistent and consistently focusing on policy, and now she's getting traction. Uh, is that what needs to happen for you to get that kind of traction? Well, we're, we're hiring up, staffing up, uh, so I, I imagine something of the same is going to come with us because we're certainly not light on substance and policy proposals. You know, I've, I've had uh, two terms as governor, and I've been watching uh, this office for 20 years, so I know exactly what I would do in terms of cutting spending and what to do about the future of work and education and uh, climate change. I got the opposite policies of Mr. T on a whole lot of issues like free trade and not insulting our allies and not playing up to dictators. It's, you know, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Are it's you so trying easy. To, are you trying to, is it a bit of a taunt to try to engage him with the Mr. T thing? Like, is that, you, you hope he bites on that a little bit? Uh, it just, uh, it just occurred to me <clears throat> this morning while, while uh, shaving. That's uh, one way to, uh, uh, talk about him without getting his name into the mix, which everybody right. is thoroughly sick of. You know, right. uh, the uh, polling is starting to show that people uh, aren't uh, quite so taken with uh, the imbroglio he creates. But every having day. said that, you talk about mm -hmm. the fatigue. I mean, the, the Mueller report, it's seemingly nothing is, is going to happen out of that negative for the president. Uh, there was a recent accusation uh, uh, of sexual assault against the president. Got very little traction. Well, there's been 15 before that. Right, so, so I but think like, that's, what's it going to, I mean, it's, I, mean it, I hate to use the Reagan era term Teflon, like, nothing seems to stick. You know, I don't think that's quite true of the Mueller report. Uh, two, two or three weeks ago, 1,000 former federal prosecutors, 1,000, including myself, uh, signed a letter saying this Mueller report on obstruction of justice absolutely clear-cut case of criminal obstruction of justice. Ten instances, and it's not even close. Uh, the debate. How do you get a debate? How do you get to say that 15 percent threshold that's been used in the past? Like, what do you need to do to get on a stage with the president? Well, the 15 percent threshold might have been a bar in the past, but it's not going to be a bar this time because I'm in a two-man race. I'm going to be way over 15 percent. Well, so if he goes by the historical marker, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll play to that. 
Well, I'll right now in some polls, like Kasich, even though he's not in, is polling ahead of you. I mean, you you need to get to double well, digits to get to 15, yeah, but I mean, respect, that was months that was, ago. That yeah. was like the week after I announced. Right, so, so. But, I mean, I haven't seen a whole lot since. I mean, w how is the operation and effort to get you on a stage with him going? It, it's going fine. I mean, I, I can't I can't uh, uh, turn his mind. He's he's completely dug in and uh, and always is, but. Uh, We'll get there. Uh, it may take uh, several months. Uh, New Hampshire, often people are at 5 percent in January and they wind up winning the primary uh, in February, if you look at the historical results. And the challengers have knocked off all five sitting presidents uh, who uh, ran for re-election since the modern Republican primary in, in, uh, in New Hampshire. So the historical record is not good for where Trump sits right now. Well, Governor Well, we appreciate you coming. Hopefully, you'll come visit us again as Thank things you, Brian. unfold. Thank Governor you, Governor William Weld. All right, coming up next, my final thoughts. And of course, if you're a Democrat, you want this field whittled down and whittled down fast. That's next on Talk Politics. Welcome back. I looked at the Republican race from 2016, and people didn't start dropping out until the fall when five candidates stepped back before the primaries. That's in a 17-person field. Based on the 24 still being in this race, you really want at least, say, eight to drop out before the end of the summer. And if you assume the four who didn't make the stage last week don't have much of a shot, you need at least four more to leave to get to 16. I have no skin in the game, but if you're a Democratic supporter, that whole theme that it's a good thing so many people are running, that's out the door by now. After last week, it's so obvious that the candidate pool is too diluted and support spread too thin. And it's important because with the strong economy, you know, unemployment at 3.6 percent and a seemingly red-leaning electoral map, unseating the president, whether you like this or not, is a major challenge. So the earlier the Democratic Party is unified behind someone, the better their chances to make it a race. That's it for this week on Talk Politics. I'm Brian Shacklin.